InfoSec Skills is releasing a new free challenge every month with three hands-on labs to put your cyber skills to the test. It's November, and with the colder weather and shorter days coming, we're burrowing deep into insecure networks to practice with the tools and techniques used by expert penetration testers worldwide. Challenge one, you'll get authentic hands-on experience using a variety of vulnerability scanning tools, the same type of tools that pen testers use to expedite processes so they can focus on target-specific tasks. Challenge two, you'll leverage a client-side code injection attack to take over a victim's browser. And for your top-level challenge, you'll enter our purple team cyber range to exploit local files and perform remote code execution. Complete all three challenges, download your certificate of completion, upload it to in LinkedIn, and tag InfoSec for your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card, an InfoSec hoodie, and a one-year subscription to InfoSec Skills so you can keep on learning. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash challenge and kickstart your cybersecurity skills today. Today on CyberWork, it is a podcast swap. Kyle McNulty of the podcast Secure Ventures joins me to talk about interviewing the people behind the most up-and-coming cybersecurity startups. We discuss the best advice he's received on the show, how to get your own podcast off the ground, and his own security startup, Consult Place. All that and more today on CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with different industry thought leaders about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Kyle McNulty is a cybersecurity jack of all trades. He has worked in, the, uh, in consulting for several years, most recently leading the cloud security and DevSecOps practices for CDW and Focal Point. Uh, he also has his own podcast, Secure Ventures, where he interviews CEOs and founders in the space. Uh, additionally, he's a founder himself, building a cybersecurity consulting marketplace, uh, which is called Consult Place, to solve problems he has faced firsthand. So it's always fun to have a fellow podcaster on the show, and we've had a few. Uh, and, and Kyle's interviewed a bunch of great guests on Secure Ventures, so I'm looking forward to learning about uh, what he's learned in doing the show and what he has planned for the future. Kyle, welcome to CyberWork. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, same goes for, for me as well, right? I always enjoy talking to other podcasters, hearing about some of their experiences, and it's great to be on, on the other side of the mic here. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It makes, makes a nice change. So um, uh, the thing I always like to uh, to ask at the start is is to just get a sense of your cybersecurity journey. Where did you when did you first get interested in computers and tech and and what got you first excited about cybersecurity? What, what was the, the initial draw? Yeah, computers was definitely very young. I uh, grew up in an age where everyone was playing video games from from a pretty early age. Yep. Uh, and then one of my first experiences with cybersecurity, which didn't even really occur to me as a cybersecurity uh, kind of scenario until later, uh, but was hacking a video game that I played with my brother growing up. Mm. Um, and so I was able to find like some basic exploits online. Wasn't anything groundbreaking that I was doing per se, but certainly just an interesting experience playing around. And then later yeah. in college, uh, discovered Batman's Kitchen, which was a, a hacking student group at the yeah. University of Washington um, and was basically just blown away by the complete lack of knowledge that I had uh, about the space and, and was really interested to learn more. Um, and so that just kind of carried on from there. Can you talk about that group? I mean, it's were they did they act as sort of mentors to you? Was it sort of a friendly rivalry? Did they welcome you in? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was definitely an, an interesting, I think, culture within that group. Mm -hmm. uh, the first meeting that I went to, there was a presentation from Extra Hop. And I remember knowing not even 40% of what was discussed in that yeah. meeting. <laughs> um, and I kind of picked up after I went to more and more meetings that there were a lot of other people that kind of stumbled upon this group, but then would just kind of move on. Um, and so because it was so daunting, I think there was kind of this understanding that, okay, only a select few are actually going to kind of continue on and be a part of this uh, very kind of close knit group. And mm -hmm. admittedly, I never made it into that extremely close knit group. They were okay. doing all sorts of capture the flag competitions, okay. uh, but I did keep going. And uh, over time, I think they realized like, okay, this guy this guy's actually here to stay. Like maybe he's not going to 
fully dive in and become like one of our key contributors in the competitions right. themselves. Uh, but he's clearly interested in the space and wants to contribute. Um, and so they were great about just kind of welcoming me in, showing me the ropes on some of the, the easier capture the flag problems <laughs> and bearing with my very novice level questions. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was a good experience all in all. And, and certainly my introduction to the more technical aspects of cybersecurity and kind of penetration testing in particular. And I, get, I imagine also the sort of the community of it, that you had all these people who are very excited about this one thing. Uh, and even if the, you know, the, the, the newcomer is, is, is sort of, they sort of sniff the perimeter a little bit, like you're, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they can, you know, they're, they're all excited about this one thing and they want to make sure that you're, you're bona fide before you, uh, you jump in as well. And that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely interesting seeing something that was still kind of an academic focus that a lot of people were excited enough about to spend like their Friday and Saturday nights doing these competitions. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, certainly was a, was a very kind of eye-opening experience about just yeah. the industry as a whole and, and how excited a lot of people really are about it. Okay. So I like to start my research on my guests by looking through their LinkedIn profile and you get a, a pretty <laughs> good sense of their, yeah, it's a, it's a really good way to sort of get a sense of the, the, the career arc and the journey. So uh, you graduated from University of Washington with a Bachelor of Science in Informatics and Cybersecurity. Uh, you had a few internships, as you said, that were, uh, you know, just to have an internship or, you know, get through the holidays or whatever. But uh, one was a, a summer internship for a healthcare cybersecurity startup. Uh, and you were the VP of communication for Isaka's University of Washington branch. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Before landing a job with uh, KPMG. So, um, you know, this, you know, I, I think we get a lot of comments in, in YouTube, uh, you know, comments after episodes and, and saying, you know, I've got this cert, I've got this certificate, you know, I've got this uh, degree and I'm just not getting <laughs> bites, you know, and I think there's this, this sort of notion that like, once I graduate, like a limo is going to come up to my front door and, and whisk <laughs> me off to my dream job. But can you talk about this period of, of learning and gaining experience and networking and how it influenced your current career path? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think for me and being able to reflect on it, being on the other side of it as well, it's kind of easier to point to some of the things that maybe at the time I didn't even realize I was kind of doing right, but then mm -hmm. uh, ended up paying dividends later on. Right. And I think the the position at ISACA definitely helped. That was just a student group within the University of Washington, but okay. being able to demonstrate the, the leadership capabilities that then translated well towards consulting, uh, but even more so, I think, and, and this is kind of the broader theme, being able to demonstrate that you have a, an interest in cybersecurity outside of classwork itself, right? There's a lot of right. people that have taken a cybersecurity class. Uh, maybe that class leads to a certification. And at the end of the day, if that's just a part of a degree, it doesn't say as much to someone who's looking to hire you that you're genuinely interested in the field and passionate about it. Like we already talked about, right? There's a lot yeah. of people that are really excited about this field. And ultimately the people who are excited about it are the people who are going to put in the time to learn and grow within the field. What I've learned so far in my experience is practically none of the knowledge from my undergraduate studies in cybersecurity actually translate very well to the real world. A yeah. good example would be security operations centers, for example, had never heard of that in college. Uh, and then sure enough, all of a sudden I learned that companies are spending tens of millions of dollars on a security operations center every single year, maybe a few million dollars just for the technology stack within their security operations center. Um, and so you do have to have that kind of desire to learn about new capabilities within security. And I think different side projects, for example, or again, getting involved with student groups, maybe it's even a cybersecurity specific internship. In my case, again, it was software development, but for a cybersecurity company. And you're able to kind of tell that story about your, your interest in the space that really sets you, sets you out from the crowd. Yeah. Did you get a sense in, in, in your early interviews like that, that they were looking at these sort of extracurriculars and, and, and seeing that you had this, this extra interest? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, another piece in particular was being able to talk about different security events that were mm -hmm. going on around the time that I was interviewing. I right. think there's a lot of folks that uh, were just kind of interested again in the space and, and we're always hoping to, to learn more, even that we're interviewing. And it's hard to stay on top of all the different cybersecurity news that's going on oh, every yeah. day. Um, and so when you're able to talk about some event that your interviewer hasn't even heard of, make it relevant to the position that you're actually applying for and ask an insightful question, the interviewer is just going to immediately think, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Something I hadn't considered before. This person is clearly bringing some new perspective to the table and they're clearly spending time in the industry because they're able to go find all these different events that are occurring. 
Yeah. No. Okay. So let's let's talk about uh, people bringing things to the uh, industry. So as as I say at the start of the show, we invited Kyle into the show because. Uh, I like talking to fellow cybersecurity podcasters. Uh, so Kyle hosts Secure Ventures, in which he interviews, to use his own words, uh, quote, cutting edge founders in the cybersecurity space. Uh, as that suggests, the emphasis is greatly on startup creators and entrepreneurs and how they got to where they are. Uh, and I see that you're also the co-founder of Consult Place, a startup aimed at building marketplace solutions to address longstanding issues in security consulting purchasing. Uh, so how did, first off, how did you get involved in the co-creation of Consult Place? And what is your interest in cyber startups in general? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, to be sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, for Consult Place in particular, just the kind of ongoing experience that I've had in, in cybersecurity consulting over the last several years has exposed a couple of kind of common challenges that have recurred within the, the purchasing process, like you mm-hmm. you mentioned in the, in the little description there, right? Uh, in particular, most people, when they go to look to purchase cybersecurity consulting services, they're going to look to their immediate network. Who do they know that used to work yeah. at X consultancy? Who on their team maybe used to work at Y consultancy? And they're going to send out an RFP to request for proposal um, yep. to maybe three firms. Now, when they get those back, they'll go ahead and, and make a kind of triage decision based on what's been provided. But at the end of the day, reaching out to three firms probably isn't going to give you a full look into yeah. the market and what's really available to you. Um, it's certainly not going to give you a competitive advantage in terms of price. Um, and a lot of times firms have varying capabilities across different domains. So mm-hmm. for example, a, a firm that really excels in application security might not have the best security operations team. That's just the nature mm-hmm. of the cybersecurity industry today is a lot of times people are very specialized. And so you have different folks delivering these different projects and different focuses within a firm. And so the whole idea behind Consult Place was providing additional visibility into the entire cybersecurity consulting market and allowing these buyers to find the consultancies that are actually going to provide the most value for them. On the seller side, it's also helping consultancies generate brand awareness. When they're able to deliver valuable services to their clients, they're able to get rewarded for that in the market that's getting increasingly congested. Okay. So do you have, uh, so you have active sort of clients that, that sort of work with the space to sort of advertise their consultancy. And then you have like, kind of like a search capability or whatever that is that that, that more or less how it works. Yep. You're on the right track. You can think of it sort of as like a a Yelp for cybersecurity consulting at this point where it's very review driven. And so when someone goes and works with a cybersecurity consultancy, they can leave a review about the type of project that they had, uh, the value that they derived from it. It's more Yelp than Upwork then basically. Yep. Exactly. You're you're not, you're not doing like the direct, the direct purchase through it then you're, you're you're just getting a sense of the the scenery or the the, the landscape. So making it a completely free service for all these different folks that are looking for that additional visibility and looking to inform some of those purchasing decisions. Okay. Um, Do you get feedback from people who have, who have used the service? Uh, Do they, it seems like it's really helping people out because, you know, I think you, you, you really hit on a nice point there where I think there's so many things that people have to do in their, in their day-to-day job in cybersecurity or otherwise, where you're given the task of like, get a consultant and you're like, I don't know where to begin with that. I don't even have a sense of what (laughs) the landscape is like. Let me just reach out to LinkedIn, people who have the right, you know, title in their name or whatever. So uh, have you heard from people who have said that this this sort of like opened up their uh, their strategies? Yeah, we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback from all the different folks that we've shown it to. I mean, admittedly, Mm -hmm. the product's still pretty early on in its life cycle. We launched fairly recently. And so we're still really building out that catalog of reviews there. Uh, That can be a little shout out to the audience here. If you work with cybersecurity consultancies and want to help contribute to this kind of community-based platform, please do go leave a review. I'm sure we can drop the the link in the in the show notes here. Absolutely. Uh, but again, a lot of the, the folks that we've talked to are saying exactly what you just said. We mm-hmm. completely identify with this problem and we're supporting it as much as we can. Okay. Uh, so tell us about Secure Ventures and, and what listeners yeah. will hear when they tune in. So what is, what is an episode that would make an excellent intro to the podcast in general, either because it's so entertaining or just encompasses the ethos of the show? Yeah, I think the the Bruce Schneier one in particular, he's probably the, the biggest guest that we've had okay. on the show so far, uh, which was, again, I was a little surprised, actually, just when yeah. uh, 
when he responded saying that he was willing to, to hop on. But I mean, if you've listened to how I built this, for example, which probably a lot of the folks here have just because it's such a popular podcast, um, mm-hmm. how I built this focuses more on entrepreneurs who have kind of already made it. So if you think about like Drew Houston of Dropbox, for example, oh, yeah. Drew's not getting a lot out of going on a podcast and sharing his story, right? That's just more yeah. him doing a favor to, to Guy. Whereas our goal is to interview founders that are still in the trenches. So these founders are working on cybersecurity companies. They're building from the ground up. They're trying to grow their sales pipelines. And I'm interviewing them to understand, okay, what are some of the the challenges that you've experienced so far? What was that transition like taking Mm -hmm. the leap into entrepreneurship full-time? What are some of the unique wins that you've had in the cybersecurity space and uh, really what's next for you moving forward? So Mm -hmm. just try to be able to to tell that founder's story as much as possible, hear about their uh, kind of career start in cybersecurity, like you kind of started this podcast off with, and then how that transitioned into their, their endeavor today. Yeah. Do you have, have, has your sort of approach to, um, you know, getting, getting their story changed at all, just in the process of, of doing the podcast? Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's definitely something that I've been continuing to work on over time and try to be kind of liberal with tweaks as I just see different opportunities and and get feedback from guests. One of the things in particular, when I first started uh, was I had a very kind of tight script. Um, Mm -hmm. And so you can even see just listening back to some of the earlier episodes compared to some of the later ones is it's very kind of like robotic, just reading through question by question. (laughs) Same, Uh, same. Whereas... Yep, exactly. And that's kind of easier and more comfortable to get started with, right? Is you have mm-hmm. that uh, kind of crutch to fall back on. But then over time, you kind of get the hang of it a little bit more. And even just as you're going through, sometimes I'll just say, oh, well, that's interesting to me, like that point that you just touched on. And so that's yeah. probably interesting to the guests as well. So let me just drill into that in a bit more detail and right. leave the conversations a lot more free flowing that way. And, and generally what I've heard is that's more enjoyable to listen to. So I'll keep going at that way, keep going <laughs> at it that way until I hear otherwise. Yeah. And I think also you you probably have noticed as well. So you started in January. Is that right? Yep. That's right. Okay. So, I mean, for me anyway, like, I feel like I've, I've learned so much more about the industry just by the sort of, you know, getting a little insight from every guest also allows you to sort of ask the right questions a little better. Like you said, when you had that tight yeah. script, it's like, you know, I know I need to get these seven pieces of information out of them. But as you start hearing the same answers come up again and again, that that sort of brings up sort of new questions or new new angles to sort of uh, to sort of nuance things out of people and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a very satisfying part of the job is is hearing how sort of mechanical I sounded on the first couple episodes yeah. <laughs> and and was just like sort of gripping the script with both hands and like, you know, <laughs> please don't ask yep. me any follow up questions. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, um, yeah, anytime, and, and anytime DNS security uh, comes on the show, <laughs> like my eyes just go to test patterns, you know, so, yeah. um, but you know, it gets better as, as you do more of it. So, so what is the most surprising insight that a guest has imparted on your show? And also what's the best piece of advice a guest has given maybe something even that you've taken for yourself in your own career? Yeah. In terms of maybe surprising insight, I've heard a lot of kind of mixed reviews on how challenging the venture capital process has been for Mm. these companies, which maybe isn't surprising if you're very kind of versed in the space, but typically from an outsider's lens, it always sounds like this kind of impossible task of raising money. And especially at some of these valuations that these companies are bringing in. Uh, But there's a lot of founders that we're able to get through it fairly easily, right? And mm-hmm. uh, able to kind of make that that leap into entrepreneurship, or re- immediately raise several million dollars and be off with just an idea and, and start building a product. And so it's been kind of incredible for me to hear, well, you don't need to actually have a full product already built out. You don't have to work without a salary for a year and a half to build a full product before this can actually be something feasible. There's a lot of people that are kind of midway through their life. They might have wife, kids, uh, and they're able to still make this transition because of some of the mm-hmm. different financing resources that are that are available out there. Uh, in terms of the second half of your question, maybe the, the most valuable insight, I think there's so many different resources that 
I've learned from entrepreneurs on at this point. And I mean, secure ventures, I think is, is no exception to that. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. even just for me as an interviewer, again, I, I hear these different stories. The biggest theme that really rings true for me is just the resilience that's required in order to build yeah. a, a successful startup. Right. So, I mean, again, a lot of these founders are kind of still in the trenches, still building. Uh, but even just hearing the stories from the ones that are a bit further along, it's like everyone's gone through some sort of difficult challenge. Oh, yeah. There's always something that's unexpected. And there's going to be a different way to solve each of those challenges for kind of every company, every founder team. Uh, but as long as you're able to just kind of say, okay, I understand that these challenges are going to come. How am I going to push through this? Maybe it's a full product pivot even, which Mm -hmm. sounds incredibly daunting, but as long as you're willing to just find some sort of strategy to keep moving forward, then you're going to keep on moving and and you're going to succeed eventually. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. I mean, that sounds like uh, sort of a transition to my next question, but were there any particular stories that you've heard where it, it seemed like, especially like the cards were stacked against you know, the startup, but it it somehow, whether by an extreme pivot or just sort of, you know, a last minute, uh, you know, intervention or something that they, they managed to still make it work. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think if you think about the timeline of when I've been interviewing some of these founders, there's probably no more concentrated time in history for unexpected surprises and just poor timing. (laughs) Right. Like I've been talking to to founders again, kind of early 2021 here. And so they're telling me their stories of going through COVID in in 2020, Mm -hmm. what that really did to to their businesses and and some of the different ways that they had to pivot. Now, thankfully, cybersecurity is certainly a less impacted industry than many others. If you think about uh, like hospitality or retail uh, or businesses like that, but uh, certainly a lot of challenges, especially again, going back to the the trying to raise money piece, uh, trying to go through pitches without actually getting to meet these different venture capitalists in person, uh, no longer being able to rely on those kind of local connections as much. I mean, in terms of examples in particular, uh, Secure Stack, for example, completely pivoted their platform uh, in the middle of COVID in part, just trying to find a new way to to get traction with customers, get traction with investors. Another good example was Invisit, Dean Shapiro. They went ahead and and pivoted from a B2B offering to B2C at some point in there as well. Or I think it was vice versa. It was originally B2C and then later transitioned to B2B, had a Mm -hmm. full name change within that as well. Um, And just trying to to capitalize on where they found their product was going to have the most fit. Where do, have you had a sense of whether um, just funding opportunities kind of got a little tighter in during COVID? Because where, where, you know, I, I know some people. You know, a lot of reports say that the you know the companies that in, invested hard when everyone else was you know storing against uh, you know future calamities or whatever were the ones that really uh, cashed out. Do you have a sense of whether uh, people were 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 making you know were taking wild chances on on startups or <laughs> were or were they keeping their cards a lot closer to their chest just because of the uncertainty of the future? Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, if you think about March, April, May last year, it mm-hmm. certainly slowed down for a couple oh, of yeah. months. There was just so much uncertainty in terms of oh, yeah. what was really going on in the market, how some of these different uh, startups were going to be able to succeed and kind of push through. But if you think mm-hmm. about past those couple of months, it picked back up very quickly. And if yes. you look at just kind of year over year investment, if I remember correctly, 2020 actually had more startup investment uh, than like VC backed investment uh, than 2019 did even. So it certainly picked back up there. But again, it's really challenging for a company if you're trying to raise money in a kind of short time frame, and then three months are just kind of wiped off of the board. And then there's kind of this backlog of companies that are trying to raise money, you increase competition. So even though more money is being shelled out, part of that could also lend itself towards higher valuations, as opposed to supporting more companies. So there's a lot of different right. factors that are at play there as well. Okay. Um, so since since the focus of this specific program or your this your your podcast is the ups and downs of startups and their creators, uh, can you give our listeners some advice for someone who wants to get involved in a, a startup? I know we all know the process of a startup is fraught and exhausting and more so with, with COVID, <laughs> but uh what, what what are some hidden challenges that you you didn't even plan for until they until they happened? 
Yeah. I mean, we already talked about the the resilience piece a little bit. Yeah. Uh, another one to, to kind of harp on that I think holds pretty true with a lot of these different uh, organizations is around experiencing the problem yourself um, and the idea of having this kind of hidden competitive advantage. It's something that Peter Thiel talks about a lot, uh, but having this kind of earned advantage where you've experienced some sort of problem, which gives you a unique insight that allows you to, to better solve that challenge and come up with more uh, creative and kind of spot on solutions that actually address it. So in the cybersecurity space, as a result of that, you often see folks that are a bit older than you might expect, again, kind of starting some of these different companies because mm -hmm. they have that time in industry to experience a lot of those different challenges. And then they decide to go out and solve them themselves. Um, and so that's, again, just kind of one area in particular, if you're thinking about founding a startup what are some of the challenges that you've actually experienced so far? And how do you, how could you brainstorm different solutions to go ahead and address that? And then how can you go forth and make sure that other people are experiencing this problem as well? You're not the only one just due to unique right. instances in your environment um, and yes. then just kind of build out from there. Yeah. Uh, so um, on a more meta level for listeners who might want to share their own insights in cybersecurity by creating a podcast, do you have any advice for <laughs> podcast newcomers, either technical aspects or the process of finding guests? How's, how's it been for you in this first year? Yeah, honestly, I would say do it. It was yeah. way easier than I ever expected that it was totally. going to be. And I don't, yeah, it sounds like you've had the same experience, uh, but yeah, I remember start anywhere. Yeah. Start anywhere, yeah. start at any level of technical competency. Just, just, just start, just start getting a, a, a steady schedule. Yeah, exactly. People know, and people know to look forward to you every, every week or whatever. They're going to start tuning in. Yep. And I mean, I know my biggest concern when I was first kind of brainstorming on secure ventures and what that might look like. So I was like, who is going to want to talk to me? What founders are yeah. going to be willing to share their time with me to, to go through these stories? These are CEOs, executives. How are they going to have time to come talk to Kyle McNulty? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Sure enough, I went ahead and built a, a list from Crunchbase of just different cybersecurity startups in the space um, and started DMing some founders on LinkedIn, just kind of hoping for the best. Yes. Uh, had a response after my first cold message on LinkedIn within six minutes from Ari Jacoby saying that he was interested and he ended up becoming the first guest. And that Amazing. was just an immediate change in perspective for me. Yes. I just discovered that, okay, I thought this was going to take I mean, weeks, maybe even longer, maybe this was going to totally fail before I even got started. Instead, mm -hmm. after six minutes, I'd validated that I was onto something here and that people were yeah. willing to, to come talk to me. So like I mentioned earlier, there were certainly improvements from a technology standpoint. I think that those first yep. couple episodes I recorded on AirPods um, and yeah. now I've got a, a mic and, and a headset here. Oh, I yeah. still know mic like your setup. So there's still a, there's still a ways to go, <laughs> but um, I don't know again, if this is necessarily better. It's just what's happening next year. So we'll just keep trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so just like being willing to, to get started, give it a shot. And yeah. it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? The same kind of resilience that comes with building a startup. I mean, if you just apply that and think, okay, how am I going to just go for it and give it a shot and then work through any challenges that yeah. came up. I mean, in terms of, I, I know you mentioned the technology pieces as well. There's so many platforms that make it easy to manage every other aspect of the podcast. Mm -hmm. I personally use Anchor for actually publishing the episodes and distributing it out to all the different platforms, mm -hmm. completely free to use. I use Alphonic uh, to actually help with some of the post-production editing. So the work that I have to do from an editing standpoint is fairly minimal, which is good because I'm not a great uh, audio editor by any yeah. means. Right. Uh, right. And so having some of these different tools that are available, again, completely free. I don't monetize my podcast. It's just sharing these yeah. stories uh, makes it much more feasible to actually move forward with all this. Yeah, that's that's something I want to add, too, is is I think if you're especially if you're a company that wants to start a podcast or whatever, to have reasonable expectations of what's going to happen at the outset, like do it to do it. Like there's, you know, if you, if you're like looking to make money off of it within three months or six months or whatever, like that's a, that's a losing prospect. Like we started this yeah. just because we wanted to have a podcast in the space and also, uh, you know, just something value added to our, our classes and so forth. And it took off faster than we expected. But I think if we had like, you know, made ourselves these deadlines of if it's if it's not great we're pulling you know after three months we're pulling the plug 
like that's it's not going to work. It just it just sort of happens over a long period of time and 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 a lot of grind. I think. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, again, as long as you kind of put the time in and have that that long time horizon. I mean, I know for me, I was definitely hoping the listener count was going to explode a little bit faster. Uh, yeah. But as long as you see kind of that steady growth, that's exciting. Get, and again, you get little lurches now and again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, like you mentioned, right, you're not in it for the listener count. You're not in it for the money. If that happens at some point after that continuous growth, great. Uh, but that's just kind of a value add. I mean, as long as, yeah. again, for me, it's kind of sharing the stories of these different founders, learning directly from them um, and learning more about what it looks like to be a founder in the cybersecurity space. That's all interesting enough for me. So how, how far out in advance do you have guests booked and do you have any dream guests that you're, you're dying to get on the show that we can <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shout yeah, out here? Uh, I mean, in terms of booking out guests, it definitely fluctuates over time. Yeah. Um, I've had points earlier this year where the backlog has been like three and a half, four months. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've had points where it drops down to one month. So mm -hmm. typically it'll be a significant period of time because I only do episodes every other week uh, just right. to try to make sure that I'm able to balance all the other responsibilities going on yeah. uh, with the, the full-time consulting gig and then also all the consult place stuff. Um, but I mean, in terms of dream guests, uh, honestly, I, I was thinking about this one a little bit more and it would probably fall outside of security, but I'm going to go with it anyway. I think interviewing Elon Musk would probably be a, a super interesting conversation for me. Right. Uh, for that's sure. probably pretty basic, but um, yeah. just picking his brain on maybe some topics that he doesn't normally talk about, mm -hmm. um, like healthcare, for example, like getting his thoughts right. on, on what that might look like and maybe some of the technology driven solutions that he might have in mind. Uh, for one of those spaces or mm -hmm. finance again, outside of his kind of major, right. uh, well, I guess he's starting to talk about finance a little bit more with all the, the Dogecoin stuff, at least yeah. manipulating markets. But <laughs> um, yeah. do you, have you sort of um, changed your, your, your questioning policy in terms of, of guests? Do you find that certain questions don't work and you sort of rotate them out or, or, you know, like, a, you know, a surprising conversation in one interview will, will sort of rotate into, uh, you know, standard questions for future interviews. Yeah. I think it's happened more kind of informally than yeah. formally, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly over time, I recognize that there's certain questions or kind of areas of discussion that might not be as interesting as I'd hoped when they're written up on paper. I mean, something to keep in mind, right, is a lot of times when folks are coming on to this podcast, they're doing so from kind of a, a brand and, and PR purpose, right? Yeah. And so they can't be 100% honest with everything yes. that they talk about. Um, and so it's kind of tempering, okay, how do we get at some of those interesting details without getting to the, the components you're able to share. Uh, a good yeah. example of that is I've had a lot of folks on the show who are ex-military, especially like mm -hmm. ex-Israeli military. And yep. for me, I always wanted to hear, okay, what are some of those like crazy cybersecurity stories mm -hmm. uh, that probably got you especially interested in the field um, in that kind of role? But ultimately, that's just a, a topic that these guests can't really talk about. And so I've yeah. dropped that one entirely. <laughs> Yeah, I was just, I was going to ask how 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 hard hard are you willing to push? Have you had any like pushback from guests in terms of you're asking two personal questions or anything? Yeah, I mean, I haven't had anything from a, a too personal standpoint. I mean, or too classified like, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, from a, a too classified standpoint, I'll certainly just immediately back down. Right, I'm not trying yeah. to have someone divulge information that they're not allowed to share. That's not my goal on the show here. Right. I definitely want to make sure that my guests are, are comfortable and I haven't run into any scenarios where they're hiding something that mm -hmm. seems like it should just be uh, kind of where it seems like they should be very forthright. Um, I haven't run into any issues like that. So. Yeah, not every podcast has to be an expose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so apart from potential startups and podcasts for that matter, a lot of our listeners are just starting to think about careers in cybersecurity in general, or they might be entry-level positions like uh, you know help desk, and they're trying to take the next step up. What tips do you have for newcomers who might feel intimidated about where uh, where they're at or how to you know start their their job choices? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, this touches back on a couple of those different pieces that we talked about earlier, right? But mm -hmm. uh, another couple components that tie into that 
is just understand that there's very much a need for cybersecurity professionals in the industry right now. There's been negative unemployment in the space for several years. And Mm -hmm. so companies are willing to bring in a lot of those junior level positions. Now, look, not every company is willing to take in someone who has no hands-on cybersecurity experience, but there's more and more of these kind of rotational programs that are spinning up, uh, just other opportunities that say, hey, if you're interested in cybersecurity, we'll give you the opportunity. But this goes back to what I talked about earlier, right, is really demonstrating that you have that interest in cybersecurity and that uh, that you're willing to put the time in and the effort. Right. If you work in a help desk, for example, you have to be able to tell that story of kind of why you're interested in cybersecurity, what you've done that relates to cybersecurity in some capacity, maybe how you're spending some of your free time outside of work in order to accomplish that rather than just saying, I work in the help desk. I've dealt with some cybersecurity focused tickets and I want to do more cybersecurity. That's not as compelling of a case. There's a lot of people who are trying to do that same transition. So you Mm -hmm. have to go that little bit extra in order to kind of stand out from the crowd. Yeah. So uh, as we wrap up today, um, can you sort of tease anything that's uh, happening on the podcast that you're excited about that's coming up? Um, or, is it, or is it all a secret? No, it's definitely not all secret. I mean, okay. I'm always excited about some of the different guests that I'm talking to. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've been a, a bit more kind of lenient with over the the past handful of months, and this goes back to just kind of general changes over time, is not interviewing strictly founders. Uh, so mm-hmm. Bruce Schneier is a, a good example of that. While he's founded like his blog, for example, he hasn't founded a cybersecurity company. I interviewed right. uh, Eric Cole. He actually, again, founded like a cybersecurity consultancy, but the main topic that we discussed was him being an author. Um, and so one of the episodes that'll be releasing shortly is me interviewing a, a chief information security officer at a major energy company. And mm-hmm. so again, kind of share a different perspective on the podcast rather than just the founders themselves who've kind of built these companies. Well, what are some of the parallels that we can draw from a cybersecurity leader within a company in terms of uh, how it might compare and building a team, working towards different objectives um, and having some of those different goals and, and the challenges that they've faced along the way? Okay. Um, we've talked about Consult Place a little bit. If you want to uh, talk any more about some of you know, you know, your upcoming uh, work with that, uh, feel free. Also, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about your work with Focal Point Data Risk at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I kind of alluded to earlier in the episode, from a Consult Place standpoint, if that's something that is interesting to you, again, if you work with cybersecurity consultants um, and want to go ahead and leave a review on the platform, that's certainly helpful for us to continue growing. If you're a consultancy that's trying to grow and yeah, completely Mm -hmm. free, Mm -hmm. it only takes a minute. I've designed the the user experience to make sure it's as easy as possible to go ahead and leave a review. Um, And again, if you're a consultancy and you're trying to gain some brand awareness, uh, either reach out to us or uh, go ahead and talk with some of your different customers and get them to leave a review on the platform. It's free marketing for you that way as well. Uh, So there's no issues with that. Uh, from a CDW focal point side, I mean, I'm really excited with everything we've got going on from an attraction standpoint. Uh, again, came from focal point data risk. We just got acquired by CDW just a mm. couple of months ago. And then yeah. just uh, in the last couple of weeks, they now acquired Sirius as well. So mm. CDW is really making a name for themselves as kind of the biggest player in cybersecurity reselling. And now they're making that transition into services as well. So there's all kinds of growth opportunities. Uh, again, I especially specialize in cloud security and DevSecOps. So if you're interested in just having a conversation about some of the challenges that you're dealing with there, please feel free to just shoot me a message on LinkedIn and we can kind of get connected from there. Um, There's no cost, no pressure. Happy to just kind of share some insights and and thoughts. Nice. All right. Well, uh, that's the last question for all the beans here. If our our listeners want to know more about you, Kyle McNulty, Secure Ventures Podcast, or any of these other things, you want to uh, throw some URLs at us? (laughs) Yeah, sure. I mean, probably the number one place to go is just my LinkedIn profile. And then you can kind of crawl out from there, but (laughs) secureventures.io or secure ventures on any podcast app, wherever you're listening to to cyber work here, Uh, consult place is just consult.place. Pretty easy. Um, And again, CDW, that's a, that's a very straightforward one. You'll probably get lost (laughs) if you try to look at their website for more than like six seconds. Uh, But again, just shoot me an email and I'll get you uh, whatever resources or, or conversation you need. All right. Well, Kyle, thank you again for joining me today. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Chris.
Uh, and as always, I'd like to thank everyone at home listening or watching at home, at work, work from home. The new episodes of the Cyberwork Podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. I'm excited to announce that our InfoSec Skills platform will be releasing a new challenge every month with three hands-on labs to put your cyber skills to the test. Each month, you'll build a new skill ranging from secure coding to penetration testing to advanced persistent threats and everything in between. Plus, we're giving away more than $1,000 worth of prizes each month. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash challenge and get started right now. Thank you once again to Kyle McNulty, and thank you all again for listening and watching. We will speak to you next week. Thank you.